at 36 uh, participants and counting, and we're going to go ahead and, and start the webinar. Um, I want to thank everyone who has attended for attending. Um, we had found, uh, we meaning the Rochester pollinators, had found that many people had a lot of questions about starting a pollinator garden or once they've started it, what, you know, are there more plants they could plant or learn more about plants or how to do it better? So I um, was fortunate to uh, gather together three experts to help with that. I am Marilyn Trent. I founded uh, Rochester Pollinators in 2019 when I got a mailer from the Environmental Defense Fund that said the monarch butterfly was in um, really devastating decline between 70 and 90 percent depending upon the year. So I am a, we are a committee of the city of Rochester and um, our mission is to uh, provide education, and this is one part of our mission, this webinar, and resources to protect the monarch butterfly and other pollinators by reintroducing native plants into the local landscapes. What we say, put it back the way nature intended. She, knows, she knew what she was doing. Um, so just in the past two years, I have seen increasing interest in pollinator plant, plants from the national to state and local levels. That includes Oakland County, just in the past year, has started um, Oakland County Sustainability or on a mission or ha uh, a department. And uh, they have uh, taken on the pollinator initiative as well. And they've been doing more and more here. Um, and I feel most importantly, that grassroots efforts that are shown today with the amount of attendees, attendees and the amount of people and followers that just the pollinators have, that, uh, th that we can, we're making it, we're going, we're the, the ground level of making a difference. So, um, so many that we ended up with a waiting list uh, for people to attend for the live webinar and we had over 700 were interested on our Facebook invitation. So we're excited to say that as well. So with no further ado, I would like to introduce our three experts, Dr. Mary Jamison, she's a biology professor at Oakland University. Um, Brenda Dizek, she's a speaker and lecturer and author of Raising Butterflies in the Garden. I think it's a Bible of butterflies in the garden. <laughs> Maybe that's what we should call it. Um, and Carolyn Miller, she's the president of the Wildlife Association of Michigan and she's a botanist. But last but not least, um, Rachel Williams is here with me who was the, the first person who spoke and I couldn't do this without her. She is also the board chair of the City Beautiful Commission of the City of Rochester. Uh, digital marketing manager extraordinaire and anything you need done with Rochester pollinators uh, she makes sure it gets done so thank you again and um, we will start out with Mary Jamison and Dr. Jamison is that right yeah she is a biology professor and her research focuses on understanding the effects of human caused environmental change on plants and insects. She studies ecological interactions between plants and their insect herbivores and pollinators. Through research collaborations, she has also recently begun studies that examine plant insect microbe interactions. She specializes in the field of chemical ecology, conducting research, examining how plant secondary um, metabolites, including chemical defense compounds and volatile comp compounds can influence uh, species interactions. Yeah, really, she's very smart and she knows exactly what she's doing. <laughs> she can explain what all this means, but I am, I, I couldn't have done the pollinators without her. She, uh, she was graced us with her knowledge and intelligence and helped us with the founding of the Rochester pollinators. And from this, you can tell she helped us get it right. Uh, beyond her academic pursuits and scientific curiosity, she loves to explore the outdoors, discover beauty in nature, and engage in creative activities. So there you go, Dr. Jamison. Take it over. Great. Thanks so much, Marilyn and Rachel, for organizing this event. It's my pleasure to be here today and to share with you some of the tips I've learned myself from other experts um, throughout Michigan and terms of butterfly gardening. So can you all see my screen and hear me, Marilyn? Yes, I can hear you. Is it a way to, is it Google? Is it in Google Slides or can you make it 
larger or, or I'm not sure how it's created, right? Presenter or does it? Um, that might be on your setting on Zoom. I don't know. It's full screen for me. I, Rachel, how is, how's it for you, Brenda? She, it's good. Okay, it's good. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, I think you can change the view. Um, I see. I, I got it. Yeah, you can. Thanks. Make me really small. You can <laughs> eliminate oh, my face. Yes. You can make the whole presentation full screen for those of you guys who aren't as familiar with Zoom. I'm still learning myself, so. Okay, great. Okay, well today, as I mentioned, I'm gonna just share with you a few tips about pollinator, creating a pollinator garden, maintaining a garden, pollinator garden, kind of take you through a picture show of some of my favorite plants for pollinators. And so I'll just start out here by telling you a little bit about myself. So, I'm the principal investigator in the Jameson Biodiversity Lab at Oakland University. And as Marilyn said, um, my research group is focused on supporting plant and insect conservation. Uh, we study a variety of different insects from pollinators uh, to herbivores and butterflies and bees. And so in my research group, we have a number of undergraduate and graduate students who are really leading the research and conservation efforts and putting a lot of work into helping us uh, with our efforts to support plant and insect conservation. I couldn't do this without them. We've been involved in trying to help promote native plants in particular and have worked on starting pollinator gardens across Southeast Michigan. There's just one example of a pollinator garden we created last year. Um, here you can see it uh, features several native species, but we're also including uh, some of the annual species in here that are favorites among gardeners, like the, the zinnia and um, cosmos. Um, but we have the native species like the rutabecchia and the yarrow and bee balm and butterfly weed. And I'll talk a, a little bit more about these species here in a second. So what we're trying to do here and what I, I the talk is mar marked as a, bio, a butterfly garden, but I really wanna promote just more generally gardening for biodiversity conservation. Not only the conservation of uh, native plant species uh, and butterflies, but of all insects in general. So uh, what we're doing, of course, in terms of butterfly gardening, we want to make sure we're including butterfly host plants for those larval uh, caterpillar, those larvae and caterpillars. We're also trying to create and maintain habitat, though, for other pollinators like bees and also trying to create habitat for insects in general. And so in order to do this, it's really important that we try to avoid pesticides in our yards and in our pollinator gardens, of course, but also in our lawns. Uh, we wanna especially avo avoid insecticides, but also herbicides um, that can not only eliminate some of the important host plants, but that can be positive, uh, potentially negative to some of the other pollinators. And of course, the goal of this is all so we can observe and enjoy these butterflies, these beautiful pollinators and the plants that support them in this reciprocal beneficial uh, mutualistic relationship. So the key aim here is really to enhance and what I'm talking about is to enhance both plant and pollinator diversity. Um, I really want to make a little bit of a, a plea for a, a greater appreciation for bee diversity in addition to butterfly diversity. Sometimes it's a little bit harder to appreciate our native bees because they're a lot smaller and harder to see. But if you just take a minute to look at your garden and look up close, you'll see some some of these bees are really amazing. They are little pieces of artwork. We have 
these beautiful green bees and um, just some amazing patterns and colors on these bees. In addition to the butterflies, which I'm sure you're all, you're avid butterf butterfly people here to learn more about butterflies. Um, so why do we care about these organisms beyond just that they're amazing, beautiful creatures? Well, we care about them and we want to protect them because unfortunately insects are in decline, not just the monarch butterfly, uh, but we've seen significant declines in insect populations for many groups of insects and many species. Uh, here's just a couple of data graphs that I'll show you. I think these are the only data that I'll show in this presentation. But population, these are, are two graphs showing population trends of insects that are tracked by the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Um, and so as you can see here in this first graph, this is the percent of insect species that are showing population declines, so decreases in population. Um, we have our beetles, our Hymenopterans or our bees, wasps, ants. We have our Lepidoptera or our butterflies. We have our odonates, dragonflies, damselflies, and we have our Orthoptera or our grasshoppers. So you can see we're seeing significant decline across a lot of these insect groups. Um, here's the percent decrease that we're seeing over the last 40 years. So you can see that many of these groups have decreased by more than 40%. Um, butterflies here, of course, and, um, the bees and wasps and uh, dragonflies, damselflies, all showing significant declines. And this is a very recent data that have come out. And why do we care about these declines? Well, insects are very important and most ecosystems. They are the foundation of ecosystems and pro providing a very important ecosystem services, both as a food source for other organisms such as birds, bats, uh, other vertebrates. They also provide pest control services. Here we have little parasitoid wasps, these cotija that are on a, a tobacco hornworm, which can be a pest of a lot of uh, our garden plants like tomatoes, and they're important in nutrient cycling. So caterpillars, um, they recycle or cycle nutrients like carbon and nitrogen. Um, here you can even see that they actually sell caterpillar poop for fertilizer. So here, this is uh, insect frass. Frass is just another name for insect poop. <laughs> And you can buy this um, to fertilize your, your garden as an organic source of fertilizer. And, and importantly, what we're talking about today, and we're focusing on the pollinators, uh, insects provide important pollination services responsible for almost 90% pollination for almost 90% of angiosperms or flowering plants. They're not only important for um, helping with fruit set for our crops, but also for our wildflowers. So they've been shown even in a crop that is self-fertile like strawberry to improve the overall fruit quality um, as well as uh, fruit nutrients. So we'll focus on um, butterflies today, just to give you a little bit of overview of butterfly diversity. Um, we have about 160 butterfly species in Michigan, 750 butterfly species in the US, and about 18,000 species in the world. But I also just wanted to touch on bee diversity as well, because these are by far the most important pollinators for plants and our crops. They have specialized hairs and structures on their bodies to actually carry pollen. So they're, they're much more efficient than butterflies, although butterflies are very important in long distance gene dispersal and um, as pollinators for some species of plants. 
Uh, for bees, we have 20,000 species worldwide, more than that, certainly, and uh, 3,600 species, almost 4,000 in the U.S., about 465 species in Michigan that we know of so far. So in creating a pollinator habitat, we're trying to restore habitat in our yards to help protect uh, these species, which, have, which are of global conservation concern and supporting these vulnerable plant and pollin pollinator populations. So just to take you through a little bit of a picture show of my favorite pollinators, of course, we have the flags, the flag star pollinator, the monarch butterfly here on rough blazing star. Uh, these are liatris species are very attractive to butterflies, a great one to put in the garden. We have the American lady on purple cone flower, another favorite of our butterflies, a great one, another great native plant to have in our garden. And the American copper on New England aster. And here, I love this picture because you can see the pollen on the proboscis of this pollinator. So clearly, we can't argue that this, this butterfly um, it's clearly making contact uh, with pollen and uh, stigma and uh, certainly transferring pollen from flower to flower. Here's a close up. You can see it even better, all of that pollen on the body of this butterfly. Um, but as I mentioned, bees are especially important, especially bumblebees. They have a special pollination system, they buzz pollinate, so some flowers can only be pollinated uh, with this buzz pollination or it's highly efficient for some plant species like tomatoes. And bees are extremely diverse, which makes them also a really great pollinator for diversity of plants. Here we have our bee balm, our monarda, um, also known as wild bergamot, which is a favorite of both bees and butterflies attracting. Here we have a brown belted bumblebee and a small um, little sweat bee here. Our carpenter bees here on obedient plant, another favorite uh, native plant species. And two little mating adorable mating longhorn bees on um, this aster species. So just to get into um, creating, how do we create a garden? Here's a, just a picture of a garden we started last year at the Oakland University Student Organic Farm. Well, the first step is going to be designing your pollinator garden. And I think uh, Rochester Pollinators has a really nice pollinator garden design that you can find on their website. This is one garden that we that I helped design along with the, the found, other founding members of the Rochester Pollinator. And I just love this design. These are some of the fa my favorite plants to plant in my garden. And here's a nice little layout. This is a simple kind of four feet wide by seven and a half feet or seven to 10 feet long garden here. Um, just one recommendation. Um, so context matters when you're planting your garden. And so you might hear that some of these species, uh, perhaps uh, wild columbine could um, spread aggressively in some areas. Well, one thing to keep in mind is, yes, if you're planting this in a, a sunny area, it's likely to spread. If you're planting it in a shady area, it might not spread as much, uh, but one thing you can do to help some of these plants from really overtaking your garden, especially the native species that might be good self-seeders and spreaders, is to create competition in your garden. And one thing I really like to do in my pollinator gardens is to intersperse grasses. Uh, two of my favorite grasses to intersperse are uh, little blue stem and prairie drop seed. So one thing to keep in mind, we want to create competition, as you see in nature. Um, of course, butterflies need nectar plants, and so when we're thinking of what to put in the garden, we often think about these nectar plants. One important thing in planting your garden is to make sure you have a variety of plant species that span early season, like this golden Alexander plant, which is a host plant for uh, black swallowtail. Uh, 
This is a nice early spring plant that's great for bees and butterflies. It is one though that self seeds quite readily. And um, in our garden, what we do is we um, carefully top off the plants before they go to seed, making sure that we're not getting any butterfly eggs. <laughs> when we do that, we wanna inspect those before we, we top them off. Um, but in addition to nectar plants, of course, we need host plants in our gardens, um, things that will support the larvae. And this is really one of the most important things for attracting butterflies to your garden. So I'm sure all of you are familiar with uh, butterfly weed to support uh, monarch butterflies. This is one of Asclepias tuberosa is one of my favorite uh, milkweeds to plant. Uh, we have other species of milkweeds like the common milkweed that can be a little bit aggressive in, in a small yard. So, um, you know, another good milkweed is uh, swamp milkweed to plant. Um, and so another thing I just like to remind folks of is that weeds support butterflies. And so sometimes these aren't the pretty attractive flowers that we want in our garden, but in fact, they might be good host plants. Here's actually a picture I just took a couple of days ago of a, uh, eastern tailed blue that's laying an egg here on a hot clover. This is actually an introduced species. It grows readily as a, a, a weed in your yard, um, but it's a small plant that doesn't, it's not really aggressive. And so I tend to leave that in my yard. And so not all weeds are created equal, of course. Um, some things are invasive and then non-native invasive species, of course, we want to control those, but other species that are more cosmopolitan weeds in our yard that aren't problematic, we might want to leave those. And so um, that's something to keep in mind. In addition to all these wonderful native plant species, we might want to think about leaving some of those other um, little weedy species that provide host plants. I thought I had one other picture. Um, but we'll see if it shows up here later. It might be out of um, place. Um, so if you want to learn more about some of my favorite uh, plants for pollinators and butterflies, you can follow along on Instagram. I have an account, uh, Plants for Pollinators, where we highlight some of the different things that we've planted in our gardens at Oakland University. Um, you can also find other great resources. Michigan Wildflower Farm has a great planting guide, especially on um, starting a pollinator garden from seed. They have nice resources, 10 steps to planting a poll pollinator garden. Okay, this was actually the picture that's out of place. That I, so this was another reminder that weeds are important for butterflies. This is one of my favorite butterflies, uh, the buckeye, common buckeye. And the common buckeye has a variety of different host plants, but two preferred host plants are actually a cosmopolitan introduced weed, a plantago species or plantain species. And we have a couple of species that occur very frequently in your yards and gardens. I like to actually let it go to seed in my yard. Um, but this is something you might not, you, this is one of the reasons why they suggest to mow your yard high or maybe sometimes mow around these. It's also another one of the reasons why we don't really want to use herbicides in our yard yards if we want pollinators. Okay, so now how do we plant these gardens? Well, one way is we could, if you have a lot of land or if you have an area along your the fence line, uh, one thing you can do is you could seed into these areas. And a great resource for how to seed would be Michigan Wildflower Farm. They have a great guide for that. I like this because it really creates a naturalistic planting. And you can purchase different seed mixes that have a range of uh, forb diversity. So forbs are our flowering plants, like our fairy coneflower and our um, some of our other favorite butterfly nectar sources. In addition, there are grasses that can be in these seed mixes. And I think that this creates just the right amount of competition for a really nice naturalistic planting. So this is my recommendation for perhaps doing something along a fence line or in a larger area. Um, of course, one thing you will have to do, you know, I, I say don't use herbicide, but one thing you might have to do is to eliminate um, area. You can uh, 
you might have to use herbicides or you can, if you have just turf grass, that's usually easy to remove mechanically. But more commonly, when we have a small garden, what we're going to do is likely design the garden where we want the plants. And in that case, I recommend really using native plant plugs. Uh, this is a picture I just pulled off of uh, Instagram, not the best quality, um, but from a local nursery um, or a local company, so Flora, just showing what a plug looks like. So a plug is essentially a small plant um, typically, you actually want to buy your plants before they flower. And so this is a uh, penstemon here, a foxglove penstemon. And you can see this has a really nice hardy root system. Um, two of the best times to plant are early spring and in the fall, when, uh, when you don't have to be too concerned about watering your plants. Um, and so another recommendation is really to try to find these local Michigan genotypes. Those are the species that are going to do best in our environment. You don't have to water them. You don't have to fertilize them. Just put them in the ground. You might think they're dead, but they'll come back next year. And so um, I think that's, uh, a, you know, really what you want to focus on. Um, and so, of course, one of our favorite uh, local nurseries is wild type. Uh, they have a variety of native plants for different environments. You can check out their website. Um, and then I'll just kind of end here saying that one of my recommendations is really to talk to other people who plant native plants to figure out how you're going to garden. I myself have made a number of mistakes in my own garden. You learn through your mistakes and you learn how to garden better. One of my favorite uh, native plant gardens in our area is, uh, by, is Gallagher Park, Oakland Township. Uh, ben Vander Whitey and his group with Oakland Township Parks, they've done a really nice job of planting a, a very diverse pollinator garden here. You can see grasses. Um, I think there are a couple of dozen species already flowering right now. And I like to watch this garden over time. It's really amazing. I get some great ideas from this garden here, including um, one nice thing um, that they do here is um, in, in the early spring. So one thing you want to do is you want to leave your plant material in the fall because that might have overwintering butterfly. Um, you might have uh, lar pupae, larvae, or even eggs um, that overwinter. And so you want to leave your plant material. But in the springtime, after the temperatures warm up enough, um, say to 70 degrees, you can remove that material and then you can just lay it down, especially the grasses, and it just creates a nice straw-like um, mulch there. So you don't have to bring in a lot of mulch. Um, and in some cases, you might want to leave some bare ground for nesting bees. Okay, so just in conclusion, I wanted to have one call to action. I know uh, Marilyn wanted us to do this. Um, I just want to say, uh, Get involved with a citizen science project. That's a great way to learn more about uh, butterflies. We host one, Oakland Township Parks and Rec on iNaturalist. You can uh, get online, take pictures of butterflies in your garden, um, and really just get out there and observe what you're seeing. Uh, we also have a guide here. You can learn more about these butterflies um, and what their host plants are, so you can make sure you're not eliminating those in your garden or you're adding them to your garden. And this year, if you want to get involved, we have a um, pollinator bio blitz the week of pollinator. Uh, so we have pollinator week that's hosted by the pollinator partnership. This is an international organization, um, June 21st and 27th, where we're going to be recording observations of pollinators. So this again is a citizen science project. You can get online you know, just take pictures, upload pictures, dry natural sit, and it helps us collect data about um, pollinator population. So this is a great way to get involved. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I'm not sure if we're waiting till all the presentations uh, are done, but I'll just leave you guys here with my uh, email address. If you want to learn more, I'll actually be hosting a Michigan Butterfly Network training on Saturday from 1 to 3. If anyone's interested, please just Give me, um, send me an email and uh, I'd be happy to um, 
tell you more about Michigan butterflies. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Mary. That was perfect. We are going to save all questions for the end. Uh, and speaking of that, in the meantime, so, you know, if you have a question during uh, Brenda or Carolyn's presentations, or you had one during Mary's, feel free to email it to us at pollinators at trentcreative.com. Uh, if you have a question for later on, Mary provided her email as well. Or at the end, we will have you do a thumbs up and we'll do it that way rather than the raised hands. Uh, so that's a reaction. It'll be at the bottom of your screen. It'll say reactions. You can either do a thumbs up or a clapping. And that is how we will determine the order after Carolyn's presentation for the Q&A. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Jamison. That was, that was very good enjoyed listening to it. I learned something new every time. Um, so our next presenter is Brenda Dizik. She's the author of Raising Butterflies in the Garden and founder of Brenda's Butterfly Habitat, Butterfly House. Uh, she's a co-founder and president of the Southeast Michigan Butterfly Association, also known as SIMBA, a Monarch Watch conservation specialist of Monarch Watch, and a member of the Wildflower Association of Michigan. She's an advanced Master Gardener and was awarded Master Gardener of the Year for 2007 for Wayne County by Michigan State University Extension. Uh, she received the President's Lifetime Achievement Award in January of 2016, June 2016 from the U.S. House of Representatives, and she was awarded a Certificate of Special Congressional Recognition. So my uh, her yard is a certified Simba as a native butterfly garden, Monarch Watch as a Monarch Art Way Station, and National Wildlife Federation as a wildlife habitat. Woo, we can't keep up with you, Brenda, but we'd love to. <laughs> um, so uh, today she will share her vast knowledge in, in a very condensed way uh, on planting with native trees that attract butterflies and more in small spaces. Never, it looks like any challenge she will take up. So let us uh, please share your knowledge and take it over, Brenda. Really quickly while she is sharing the screen and please unmute as well, Brenda. Uh, I do see one hand raised. I have noted that as our first question following Carolyn's presentation. Okay. And I see another. Oh, you're unmuted, Brenda. Okay. And I will go ahead and share the screen now. Thank you. Yeah, it's great. Okay. So today, um, yeah, I'm just going to talk about uh, there's so many different trees that butterflies and moths use as a host plant. And I have a very tiny backyard, but I want to have those host plants so I can have such a large diversity of species in the yard. So I'm going to just cover a little bit about that. Um, so this is what my yard used to look like years ago, and occasionally a cabbage white would flutter through. And this is basically my backyard, it's very small. Well, I got interested in helping out the butterflies that I used to see as a child. And so I started studying it and learning everything I could about it just to try to help them. And this, so I started small. I, well, I, you can go smaller than this, but compared to what it is now, I started small and put in a little butterfly garden here and I had so much success with butterflies and just had a ball with that. So I continued. And this is what my backyard looks like now. I just have little paths of grass that go around the different little gardens. Um, and this way I have nectar plants for all of our pollinators and host plants for a wide diversity of species. So these are some of the trees that I have planted in the ground. Um, I have, you know, the um, tulip poplar tree, 
And th that one, just to name a few um, of the species that lay their eggs on it would be the Eastern uh, Tiger Swallowtail, the Promethea, um, the Tulip Tree Moth, um, and Cherry. Oh, Cherry's one of the, I think Oak is the most spe diversity of species and Cherry's second, I believe that's what Doug Ptolemy said. Um, but just to name a few of the species that use cherry, uh, that would be the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail, the Red Spotted Purple, the Promethea. Uh, so that would just be, you know, a few, oh, Cecropias do too. I'm feeding them right now on uh, cherry. Um, Viburnum, that's for the hummingbird clearwing. And the hop tree, now the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail and the Giant Swallowtail use that um, as a host plant. And oak, like I said, I believe that's number one for all, just hundreds of different species uh, that use it. But just to name a few, polyphemus and the pink striped oakworm moth and the banded hair streak. And you know, um, so that's just a couple of them. So these trees I have in my yard, well y'all probably, or many know that a tulip tree gets 80 to 100 feet tall. Well, I can't have that. Um, I'd have a shade garden, I want a sun garden, and plus I want the trees brindicized so I can find the eggs and caterpillars on them. So what I do each fall before there's a chance of frost freezing in, I go ahead and cut my trees down. I used to cut them, you know, um, this short. Well, you can see this one, it was like six inches. But I used to cut them that short, but I want the leaves a little bit sooner. So now you can see where I cut them. It's all two and a half, three feet. Um, I cut them in the fall. And that way, even though the tulip poplar tree, I'll have to get my stepladder to look for eggs and caterpillars, it doesn't get any taller than that. So um, I still have a shade garden. Now, even though I have lots of, you know, those trees and, and even more now, um, in my yard, I just wanted even more selection of trees that I could uh, have as host plant. So now along my driveway, I've put trees in pots. Well, after a little bit, your trees will, you know, they'll get root bound and they just will not be growing real well. So what I do then, when they start failing and just not, uh, growing real well. You can see this um, this pot right here, and you can see where I cut it off. And I'll show you what I did. This was a black willow, and it wasn't doing well at all. So um, this is what I do with my trees when they start, you know, not growing very well. I take them out of the pot, and I cut off at least one third of the roots, and then I stretch the roots out and remove a lot of the soil and then I repot them and you know you can see this is I cut I cut them back a lot so they don't take such a shock when I cut off the roots and repot them and that my black willow is just doing wonderful now so that's what I do with my trees that are in pots in the winter this is some of them. I move, and these pots are pretty thick. They're all oh, a good 16 or 18 inches tall. They're a thick pot, and they're, I believe, 18 or 19 inches wide. Um, and I move my trees to the back of my house, and then I pack mulch, and usually I just use a whole bunch of leaves, and I pack them in between each pot and on top of the pots, and that way when it snows or rains, they're still getting moisture, but the roots are being protected um, from the cold. So butterflies and moths need our help and everyone can participate in helping even all of our pollinators just by simply starting off by planting one plant. And if you want more information on butterflies and moths and the host plants, um, it can be found um, in my book, Raising Butterflies in the Garden, butterfliesandmoths.org, and on bugguide.net. And I have 
on my Facebook page, Learn About Butterflies in the Garden. So um, that's it for me. Um, so thank you very much. And like um, they mentioned, we'll be sharing questions after. Thank you, Brenda. I love the presentation. Um, and uh, it just shows that it doesn't matter what size of yard you have, you can um, have a beautiful pollinator garden. And trees, I mean, who knew? Um, and to keep and have that sun as well. So our next presenter is Carolyn Miller, and she holds a bachelor's of science degree in botany and plant pathology from Michigan State University. And she is currently the plant recorder from Michigan State University. Um, she uses GIS and GPS technology. She records the location and health of shrubs, trees across campus, 5,000 acres. Um, she loves what she does and is truly a tree hugger. Before this, she was a curator of a plant collections at the Naples Botanical Garden in Naples, Florida. And I lived there for about eight months when I was a teenager. And so I know exactly where that is. Um, where she took a keen interest in native landscapes, she moved back to Michigan and began her quest to landscape with native plants. <coughs> Through trial and error, she now knows what works in her urban Lansing yard. Um, currently, she is um, the president of the Wildflower Association of Michigan, recording secretary for the Michigan Botanical Club, a master's student biology at my Miami University, Ohio, and serves on various environmental groups in the Michigan area, mid-Michigan area. I don't know when she has time to garden. Neither do I. <laughs> <laughs> you, you say you have free time and you and your wife, Diane, enjoy birding botanizing, camping, cooking, and hanging with their cat. I think that's the, uh, what, the uh, 12th hour of the day? For Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so you have a lot of credentials, as uh -huh. you do. And um, you got so much experience, and uh, you're going to share your love of growing these native plants in urban, small urban spaces, gardens, and uh, how does that translate to the 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 um, doable size and um, how do you uh, keep your neighbors from not complaining <laughs> and, and and become envious? That's of, right. <laughs> that's right. Why I want to do that too. So uh, Carolyn Miller has mastered that, and so she's here to to share that knowledge. Okay. It's a great presentation. I've seen it a couple of times. I saw it at the conference. Uh, well, the WAM a couple years ago. Yeah, a couple years ago. Yeah, I took notes. All right. All right. I think it worked. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, and I'll chuckle because Brenda said, you know, she's got a tiny yard. Well, my yard's even smaller. And uh, like I said, it's been trial and error throughout the past five years. But it's been a labor of love. I will, I can say, I can tell you that right now. So I'm going to talk to you about using native plants in urban settings and, and on small lots. So this was a tiny front yard. And yes, you can plant native plants in your yard for pollinators, you know, bees and butterflies, wasps. Um, it was trial and error. There's things that I have removed uh, because there may be, they might be a little too aggressive. I also will trim, as um, Dr. Jamison said, trim the heads off of certain plants just so that they don't spread so bad. But yes, you can do this. So what do you need to consider if you're going to plant? You have to look at the soil type and the moisture, the amount of light, and root structures. And I'm looking, you know, this is more rhizominous versus taproot or fibrous root systems. That's a big one. So with soil type and moisture, you know, do you have clay soils? They tend to absorb water slowly. They retain water. They're hard and solid upon 
drying. And this is why native plants are great because native plants have a very strong root system to get through that, those clay soils. And that's what, it, it helps the soil aerate itself by the roots breaking it down and creating those little tiny pathways for water to percolate. Sandy soils are very coarse soils. They never have standing water because they drain extremely fast. And then moist soils, they can typically, they're typically wet in the spring and they may experience some standing water after rain. Um, the surface can dry out, but then below that subsurface, it's actually, it stays pretty moist. So it's easy to, you know, you can figure it out through, I just sort of dig down a little bit and see what it's like. Now, my parents live in Grand Rapids. It's a clay pan. It is hard as cement. Here in Lansing, I think I lucked out a bit <laughs> because it's, it is, it has, it's, it percolates very, very well. And I hardly ever have standing water, um, which, which I love. So, so the first thing we can do is look at the light. What I suggest is that you actually observe the area that going to plant. Look at it all, just watch it through the course of the day. Because um, you, you want to make note, is it full sun? Is it part sun? Is it part shade? Is it full shade? As an example, lupin, it wants it sunny and also sandy. I've tried growing lupin in my yard. My soil is, it's, it's far too rich and the lupin just never survives. So I gave up on that one. Cardinal flower prefers it prefers part shade and also likes it on the damp side. This is a big one. So rhizomatous versus tap fibrous root system. Canada anemone is a nice native plant. However, in my small yard, <laughs> I can't, I will not plant it. It runs and it just, it's, um, I have a couple clients who have this and it was the wrong plant to put in because it, it just keeps it one little tiny root fragment and it, you know, it grows. So I would suggest if you've got a, if you have a large area, then perfectly fine. But if you have a small area, be very careful of rhizominous plants. Pick more tap and fibrous root systems like compass plant. It has a very fibrous root system. Um, along with prairie dock, you know, tap root system, it doesn't run. It goes, you know, it's it goes straight down instead. So let's look about, let's look at some very nice shade plants. So I tend to, because I'm in the city, I tend to go short. Um, and so some of these are red baneberry, Virginia bluebells, maidenhair fern, trillium, uh, blue stem goldenrod. Um, they're all on the short side or, or medium. You know, you could go short to medium. Um, but again, again, one of the keys is when planting native gardens is to try to have flower sources from spring until fall. Here's some more short uh, shade plants, zigzag goldenrod, columbine, woodland phlox. Columbine can be a bit aggressive on the seeding. And so therefore I will tend to snip off, once the flowers are done, I tend to snip off the seed heads just so I can continue. In the shade, you, you know, they're not as aggressive, but if it's in full sun, I love it, but again, it will it can spread. It can really be a, a tad bit aggressive. So again, just be careful on that one. Sun plants. Now, you know, these are actually my favorites um, because I have full sun. We don't have any shade, and I will note that I actually took out all of the turf grass around our small house, and so I have zero turf grass and very warm, hot, dry conditions. And so some, I knew some plants are gonna go in. 
Uh, eventually, I hope a little bit of a shade arbor so I can plant my shade plants because I, I really I do miss those woodland shade plants. So someday. <laughs> So I I kind of have everything set up from short to to you know short to mid plant height along the sidewalk. I have the the short guys, and then it gradually increases towards to, as it gets closer to the house. I do have tall plants as well, and those are right up against the house. And that will I'll show you some of the ones that I have that I put in in, in a little bit here, but. Uh, We'll look at some of the short ones, the short and mid-height plants. I love hairy beard tongue. I actually just took this photo about a half an hour ago. It's in full, it's in full bloom. It's only about you know 12 inches, 12 to 14 inches high. That's it. Nodding onion blooms a little bit later on. See, uh, lance leaf coreopsis. It's um, it's you know it's springing into life. It hasn't you know it's not blooming yet. Comes that comes around in June. And again, I try to have plant material throughout the whole season. Uh, pussy toes, which you want something nice and short. This guy, you know, the leaves about two inches high. That's it. It puts up its flower stalk. Right now, it uh, all the flowers. Yeah, it's you know it's in the aster family. So. It looks like just a bunch of dandelion seeds out there right now. But again, this one's short and it handles that compact soil so well right up against the cement. Some other ones, prairie smoke, one of my favorites. That plant is actually buzz pollinated by the bumblebees and blooms early. And I had quite a few queen bumblebees this spring. That were hitting those flowers. Prairie Phlox, that photo I just took a half an hour ago, full glory. Um, I've had a couple small skippers, skipper butterflies that have been on that um, as in the past couple days. I've got a photo of one, I've got to try to identify it. Rough Blazing Star, the Blazing Stars are wonderful. And again, you know, this one stays on the short side, maybe two feet tall max, um, and again, it blooms later, and purple is a magnet for uh, monarch butterflies, especially when it gets towards that time, you know, that they're looking for a food source to, to fuel themselves up. One of my favorite goldenrods is gray goldenrod, Solidago nemoralis. It stays, it's about 12 inches tall, um, does, it's not as aggressive as common goldenrod is, the leaves are soft and fuzzy. Um, it's just, and again, it takes the heat. So it's right up against, real close to the edge of the, um, you know, close to the sidewalk where it gets a lot of heat. But, oh, you know, wild type has that one. So it, you know, it's, it's a keeper. And here's, a, here's some other ones that I've actually put in. I've had, uh, again, you know, mid, you know, short to mid guys. Um, uh, you know, a couple of blazing stars. Smalls penstemon is actually a Western United States species, and that one is a bat is under 12 inches. Absolutely beautiful red, kind of a dark pink uh, flowers. They're blooming right now. Uh, silky aster will bloom later in the summer. Uh, purple prairie clover. I love this plant. It's you know it's a legume, so it you know nitrogen fixing bacteria are in the is you know is in the root nodules. So that helps add a little, you know, um, what I want to say, common, you know, good fertilizer to the soil. Harebell, uh, Campanula rotundifolia, about two inches high. I've got him right up against the edge of, of that brick, you know, uh, the brick that's lining along the sidewalk. Uh, Penstemon digitalis, a little bit taller. So he's, he's kind of, you know, mid, you know, he's in the mid, mid area of the yard. Uh, bottle gentian blooms, you know, later in this, you know, late summer. That one is definitely, you know, the only the only insect that can get in that one is a bumblebee, and it's it's a it's so it's fascinating to watch them, you know, open that up and get in there to pollinate. And the key actually is 
you know, what, and which was mentioned before, short grasses and sedges can help stop a lot of seeding happening. And so these are some of the short grasses I, I like. I do have little blue stem that's in the yard that's towards, you know, that's about midway back in the, in the yard towards, and then, uh, then up against the house because it could be a little bit taller towards the, you know, towards the back of the yard. So purple love grass, Pennsylvania sedge, prairie drop seed, one of my favorite grasses. And then ivory sedge is a um, little bit shorter than um, Carex Pennsylvanica, but again, it, you know, they, it fills up and it, it creates those, I leave patches open for, um, you know, for, for ground nesting bees, but, it, you know, and it helps support all the, these, these four uh, grasses and sedges that I'd listed, they help support other plants. In other words, you know, they keep them upright and they're short enough that they begin to cover the ground and they also help support all the other plant material that I've put in. Here's some of the tall plants I put in. And again, I put these towards the house. So they're almost right up against the house. Prairie dock, probably hands down one of my favorite sylphium species. When people see the leaves on those, they just, they're in awe. And, you know, the, the neat thing is, is that the leaves are only maybe two feet tall. You know, they're huge, but, you know, that's it. And it's that flower stalk that might go up seven, eight feet, but, you know, it's a stalk. You can still see around it, but I've got them up against the house. Ironweed, this one can see quite a bit. <laughs> uh, it is, you know, it's an aster and it produces a lot of seed. So I do spend part of the spring, you know, plucking a lot of little seedlings out. Compass plant, another sylphium species, same thing, not, you know, um, with the leaves, not super tall, puts up a little taller, um, you know, tall flower stalk. Uh, this one's taken some time finally getting established. And I think this year I'll actually have blossoms on it. Uh, Culver's root, you know, um, yellow coneflower, New England aster. With New England aster, I've had them get pretty leggy. So in mid-June, towards the end of, you know, mid-June to end of June, I'll cut that plant in half and it'll, it'll, you know, it'll sprout back up again. It'll be more clumping. So it kind of clumps better and puts out more flowers and is not as tall. And of course, and then also uh, Northern Blazing Star. So what I want you to remember is that, it, just to reiterate, that insect populations are declining, our native pollinators are declining, you can remove a small portion of turf grass. And as Brenda mentioned, and Dr. Jameson mentioned, put in butterfly weed. Butterfly weed, Asclepias tuberosa, is not, a, you know, it doesn't spread, like common milkweed, so that one's good. Swamp milkweed is also good, doesn't, you know, does not spread. Um, so you can easily just take a little bit of turf out and put some of those in as well. Plant, you can plant some natives in planters. I haven't really done this, but I do know people that have done it. And educate your neighbors. Everybody walks by and wonders, and they'll stop and they'll they'll check out the flowers and they'll you know, they'll say, this is absolutely beautiful. And I, you know, I always tell everybody, you can do it too. Um, and, you know, I'm trying to start that movement in my neighborhood, but so far I, you know, I'm the only one doing it. But, and I, like, and I mentioned, yes, there's probably ordinances, but Lansing is becoming a little bit more relaxed on, you know, their mowing ordinances. Um, I believe it's under eight inches. <laughs> So I keep everything really short, right along that edge of the sidewalk, and then I let things get a little bit taller as they go back towards the house. And so far, nobody's, you know, nobody's complained. I do clients here in Lansing, same situation. We keep it nice, especially nice in the front. And, you know, it's like, you know, the classic is, yeah, you know, keep it manicured, you know, keep it nice in the front and you can party in the back. Um, so just, you know, just keep that in mind. 
And even a small planting is better than all turf. If we all do our job, and if neighbors just put in a small patch of some native plants and allow our bees and butterflies to have a food source, we, you know, we will be able to protect them and we'll be able to, you know, enjoy them for future generations. Um, and here's some helpful resources. I believe you actually got this, um, you were emailed this, but, you know, just reiterate, we've got nurseries and plenty of literature. And I know it was fast, but I thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you so much. And yes. thank you to all of our presenters. At this time, I'm going to ask um, our panel to unmute themselves. Uh, so Brenda and Mary. And we will now begin the Q&A portion. So I did allow for participants to unmute themselves. Uh, please only unmute yourself as you're asking your question. Um, so at this time, Robert Haar was the first one to ask. So Robert, please unmute yourself and you can ask your question to the panel. Thank you. Uh, my question is that I live in Independence Township outside of Clarkston and Independence uh, regulations say that milkweed is a noxious plant. Yeah. And if I even allow it to grow, I could be fined. Oh, How do I deal with a, a township board and the zoning people who are primarily developers? Uh, go is, ahead, Mary. Is it, just the, is it just the common milkweed? Because I know Livonia also has common milkweed, but um, that's the only one. And I went to the board and um, it didn't help, um, but... Um, you can, you know, you still could do perp, you can do a purple milkweed, which is Asclepias purpuracens. You can do poke milkweed, Asclepias exultata. You can do swamp milkweed, Asclepias incarnata, butterfly weed, Asclepias tuberosa. Those were, anyways, in any of the ordinances I've read, the only one is Asclepias seriaca, the common. So, um, what what is yours does yours include all of them or just the seriaca it doesn't specify it just says milkweed and i bet i bet they're talking about the seriaca yeah. but it, it doesn't go in and also list goldenrod uh it, any kind of mustard uh it, lots of native plants oh yeah that's Probably some of the species that really um, can be problematic is both self-seeding and growing rhizominously, especially with a common milkweed. In my yard, actually, I have common milkweed volunteering a lot. I know that our neighbors, or some neighbors aren't happy with it, some neighbors are. I tend to just cut it off and, you know, I'll let it grow small and then I'll cut it off. But I think that's Probably if you're growing something like the butterfly weed, uh, Asclepias uh, tuberosa, like the, the with the orange flower, they probably won't even know it's <laughs> milkweed and you could get away with that. Um, but yeah, if you're going to grow common, you know, I think they're prob you're probably not going to be able to get away with the common milkweed. And I can, I can understand um, with some ordinances why they might not allow that. And so I think that's why we want to maybe shift to some of the you know, species that aren't self-seeding so badly or aggressively or spreading rhizomously. Yes, um, the Maris Monarch Pledge um, is through the National Wildlife Federation and hundreds of Maris have signed on. So it's an educational um, uh, uh, tool that has uh, 24 actions in it that one of them is is to try to work with uh, whatever ordinances and whoever makes them city council to bring this to their attention as to how can we you know uh, identify and um, maybe change some of this to be uh, more updated uh, because more people want to plant milkweed plants so maybe that's a way to go talk about it uh, that common milkweed is the one that I, I would, I'm pretty sure, like they were, I'm sure that is what is the one they don't want at all. Uh, but I have found with outside pressure that you can change things. So 
I, when I went before the Livonia School Board or City Hall, uh, but I'm not um, a resident there, I did let them know that the state of Michigan does, it is not listed there. Um, and I said, I know it's an archaic um, law because there were so many farmers before. I said, but this, if you would follow what the state of Michigan shows, it would save you a lot of time and money. You wouldn't have to research it and because it's not listed for with the state of Michigan. But um, I suppose if I would have been a city resident, maybe they would have listened to me more, but. They do, they do. I start, I've been, I've been doing this for 20, oh, 17, 18 years. <laughs> and I start at the just personal conversations. And I tell them my new idea, and now they listen. I know it's been a while, but <laughs> still. All right. That, well, that, was, that was great. That's a great question. Thank you. Anything we can do to help? I have ideas of uh, talking points. So next we have Rebecca Jones. I'll ask you to unmute and ask your question. I have two questions. One is for Dr. Jamison. And if I started some of the species that you identified from seed right now, would they flower by the end? Would, I mean, would I see them flower? Um, particularly, I'm talking about bee balm, cone flower, and uh, black eyed Susan. And then my second question is for Carolyn Miller. I'm wondering if you could identify your favorite nursery locally that um, sells native plants, because I'm in your area. Thank you. Yeah, it's unlikely that if you start them from seed that they will uh, germinate unless you, cold, unless you stratify them. So you need to have a cold treatment. Um, it's possible if you, you can trick them. So they need to go through a winter period so I think there's a nice video that Rochester Pollinator has on their website about how to stratify seeds. We go about this in a variety of different ways. Um, and um, you can check out their video to see how you do that. And so if you, we have in our lab, we've stratified seed for a very short period of time. Some species you can stratify and, and trick into thinking they went through a winter um, just in a matter of, two to three weeks, but in some cases that won't work. So then you might not really see them for another year. Um, so I know I was talking to a colleague of mine and he said he put a ton of uh, rutabecchia, uh, black eyed Susan seeds out in his yard and nothing came up, even though it was actually a, a year ago. We've done a lot of seeding and I'll say in some cases, and depending on what the sort of history of the, the area of your yard or um, the soil is, you might not see them for a little while. Um, but those are species that will seed pretty nicely, I would say. So if you're able to get all the grass out or whatever, you're starting from kind of clean, fresh soil. Um, but I would probably recommend m waiting until the fall. I'd probably recommend trying to kill out the grass or whatever you have there, seeding in the fall and then or seeding in the winter even. You can seed on top of snow or right out before or after snow so you can actually see the seeds and then just waiting for next year. So my favorite nursery, hands down, <laughs> is going to be wild type. The wild type nursery in Mason, Michigan. That would be my favorite nursery. But do they have, um, is that wholesale mostly? Or do they have some? They, they do have, it's both. So they do have plants there. They did have their plant sales this year. I do know, uh, I believe this might be the last weekend and maybe next weekend. I can't remember off the top of my head, but you can, you can sign up for a time slot and then, cause they're limiting people, you know, into the nursery and sign up for a time slot and head on in. Um, can I just ask you this? Do you have native plant sales by different um, organizations that that um, uh, focus on native plants? Like like we in this area, we have uh, like Clinton River Watershed Council and Madison Heights is doing one. 
Is that, do you yeah. have so and and for anybody, I would look into your conservation districts. So uh, a lot of the conservation districts in the state of Michigan are they do it. They'll a lot of them tree sale, you know, shrub sale, and then they also tag that along with native plant sales. Um, another organization to look at is Wild Ones. Uh, determine. I know that our Wild Ones chapter right here in Mid Michigan. We had our plant sale at the Meridian uh, Township Farmers Market a couple weeks ago, and we, you know, we got our plants from Wild Type, and we sold out. So everybody's excited this year. <laughs> There's they, no are. About it. they are. <laughs> I I know. Um, not last year, but Bill, you Wild Type usually they have their May three weeks, and then they usually have it in august too i just looked on their website they don't have anything posted right now for august but i wouldn't be surprised if they will open that up so i just keep an eye on their uh, mm -hmm. website to see okay nice thank you all and rebecca jones is also a wonderful professor at oakland university i should say so thank you rebecca hi rachel <laughs> I, I recognize some people too. Hi, Amber. Hi, Stephanie. So, our next question comes from Margaret Rainwater. Uh, if you're able to unmute yourself and ask your question. Hello. Um, I just want to pipe in. I, I've been searching for natives as well, and I, I found um, a place called New Leaf Natives in Ypsilanti. Oh. And there's another place called East Mish Natives um, and I can't remember where she is but she's been doing some sales in Oakland County so I was so excited to find that because that's what I find is that they're so hard to find. Um, my question is about butterflies. I had some swamp milkweed and I had two little monarchs little caterpillars and I was so excited to have them and then they got eaten by something. So <laughs> do we try to protect the, the the caterpillars or do we just let nature do its thing um where do we how helpful should we be well that's up to the individual myself um i like to go out there and either get the eggs or very young caterpillars before there's a chance that they get parasitized or eaten um i like to bring the, them in and I, in fact i'm raising quite a few different species right now but what I feel is important when you do bring them in, you want them to have natural daylight hours. So you don't, you want them, you know, in a room where they're, they're going to get the amount of light that is outside. I have mine by a window um, because if they're in a dark room, it's going to trigger them to go into a die pause. Um, so you want everything as natural as possible. So um, I, I bring in a lot, um, you know, not every single one, but I bring in a lot and raise them. Um, but it is, you know, and thank goodness I don't bring them all in because, you know, our birds and, and frogs and toads and dragonflies and spiders and the list goes on and on of the species that, you know, depend on them. So um, yeah, bring a few in if you, if you, if you like. I'm going to add to that and say, um, for, if you want to do it educationally and for folks like Brenda who just do such an amazing job with educational outreach, you know, I think it's, it's good to have a few caterpillars, but I'll actually, you know, I, I have seen these situations where people will bring every caterpillar in and they'll rear them in a cage. One thing we have to be especially careful about with monarch butterflies is they do, and uh, you know, other organisms as well. They carry, uh, they have diseases like we have diseases, right? And so, especially with the monarch butterflies, they have a disease kind of short name OE. And so, I know I used to actually work in um, Monarch Watch Lab um, when I was an undergrad for four years. Our job was to take every single butterfly that we had reared in the lab and to inspect it for OE. We had to look for the spores before it could ever be released or anything. Um, and so um, that is something the butterfly could look, 
entirely healthy, but it can carry this protozoan uh, pathogen um, or protozoan a pest or disease. Um, and so that's, I think, something you want to be careful about. The other viruses also can spread. So definitely, if you're going to rear them, you want to keep them singly. But there are other issues. I mean, it's not, you do also want to have clean plant material and make sure, you know, when we were rearing them in the lab, we took a lot of steps to kind of make sure that we were having both clean plant material and also uh, making sure that the diseases weren't spreading. So that's something that you want to consider. Um, so at least if you can keep them individually, but I would really recommend unless you're doing it for, you know, an educational purpose and trying to teach your kids about life cycles or something like that, and maybe bringing one or two in, I'd recommend just leaving them there. And sometimes they disappear, but they're still around. They, a lot of times uh, what will happen is they'll actually hide during the day and then they'll come back up and, forage more, um, although they can get eaten at night sometimes. Um, I think you'll find that sometimes they're just hiding or um, they'll, they'll survive. And so, you know, we expect to have some natural mortality, um, but it's certainly not what's driving this predation that's happening in your yard is not what's driving population declines. So I tend to even be. If you do raise a few in the house, before you raise anything else in whatever you're using to kill any uh, bacteria or the, the OE parasite, it's highly recommended that, excuse, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> that you soak. <coughs> the container in a 10% bleach solution. Oh my gosh for at least 15 to 20 minutes to kill any bacteria or parasite. <coughs> Excuse me, I am so sorry. What about the enclosure some people put outside and then they just put the large plant in the enclosure with sort of netted or strained. Mm -hmm. I, I thought that was kind of a happy medium. Yeah, okay, uh, who's the next? So next, I saw Lisa Dennis, uh, her hand up and down. Uh, so Lisa, if you had a question, please feel free to ask it at this time. Um, I didn't have a question. I was just going to uh, comment on a couple of things. One was the city thing, uh, which uh, Dr. Jamison already said that, you know, if they can identify your um, butterfly weed, then, you know, then maybe they can say something. But chances are, if they just have milkweed on there, they don't know how to, they can't identify it and they don't know the difference. And they probably wouldn't have a problem with that one. Um, the second thing I was going to say is uh, Wild Type had to cancel their last uh, weekend um, because they were selling out of their plants. But you could still, you can always order, you know, they have retail orders if it's a $200 minimum order. Um, and you, sh you have to do half flats which it's not that hard to, to spend $200 and half flats, uh, it's a, about 16 plants. That's not, you know, it's good to have a nice swath for the butterflies anyways, um, so they can see it better. Um, the other option, if you don't want to spend $200, is there's a native plant expo, but the only, but it's also sold out, and that's uh, June 6th, and that's in Washtenaw County. Um, so the only way to get in now, since it's sold out, is if you want to volunteer for a, a couple hours, then you can volunteer that weekend and, um, you know, have access to the expo that way. So it, it, it would be, it's kind of a fun activity, but that's, that was my only comments. Oh, thank you. That was helpful. Very helpful. Next, we have Jillian Jackson. Hi there. Um, my question is kind of related to the acquiring of plants conversation that we've been having. Um, I, I've been going out with my plant identifying app and trying to find them like in the woods and around me. And I, I haven't done this yet, but I've been thinking about like gathering seeds from wild plants around me. Um, what, do you, what do you guys think about that? Is, should I buy them or do you think it's okay to try to harvest my own seed? I would say you could probably harvest some seed, but don't harvest all of it from the same plant. 
but rather, you know, if there's a number of, um, uh, let's, you know, we'll use the example of uh, Black Eyed Susans. So I wouldn't take all the seed from one individual. I might just take a, you know, a small, you know, a small amount from one individual, find another one, take a little bit, you know, take a little bit from that one. Just don't, you know, it doesn't do the plant any good if you, you know, if you take all the seed away. So just take a little bit of seed, but make sure, you know, that it's legal to do that. <laughs> that's, that's the key. It's just making sure it's legal to do that. Yeah, so you want to be just careful of collecting on public lands. Mm -hmm. It's likely that they're not going to allow you to collect seeds. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm sure you could, you know, on private lands, if you have a friend or if you want to collect at the OU garden, <laughs> you can probably, we have lots of seeds, especially from the ones that grow, <laughs> spread aggressively. Uh, but yeah, I, I would be careful about collecting on any kind of state, county, parks, um, places like that. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, next we have Kelly Kay. Hi, thank you. Um, my question is, I, do you have any recommendations or special considerations to think about when creating a butterfly garden in a, like a state or like a school or a child care center um, where little ones may like have access to that space? Um, I'm going to be designing an outdoor classroom and at a child care center and I just you know, worry about some of these plants that I know, like milkweed, for example, that toxic sap. Um, you know, how, how do you go about doing, planning a space like that for, around to, for kids? Um, I would, well, I have a three-year-old, so um, I have lots of gardens, you know, lots of milkweed in my yard. Um, you know, I've never encountered any accidents or anything like that. Um, I would say though, with the common milkweed, it's a lot bigger. It's, it's got a much more, more forceful uh, latex flow. So with things like swamp milkweed especially and or rose milkweed or uh, butterfly weed, those don't have as a forceful of a, a latex flow. So that's not anything I would be concerned about. I, I definitely, um, I know you're concerned though. I Someone planted some spurge out at the student farm many years ago, and I, I would, won't let my students touch that. And so unfortunately, it's growing very aggressively there. We probably need to herbicide it. Um, but I wouldn't be concerned about tuberosa, the Asclepias tuberosa, the butterfly weed with the, per, the orange flower or the swamp milkweed. And I, I think that would be fine. Okay, great, thank you. Two more, uh, Trisha Cole first, and then Margaret Rainwater will be our last one. If you have any other questions, please feel free to email us at pollinators at trentcreative.com. We can send it to the panel or use our own resources uh, to get you an answer. So Trisha. Hi, thank you. thanks everybody for such a wonderful presentation. What a gift and I sure do appreciate it. And I wanted to let everyone know that um, Madison Heights this Sunday between two and five, they are having a, a native plant sale at Civic Center Park. So if anyone's interested in that. And also there's a, there's a greenhouse in Garden City, a nursery, it's called Barson's. And they do sell a lot of butterfly plants. They also sell uh, native plants there. Yeah. Um Barsons, yeah, they're actually, they're in Westland. It looks like Garden City, but it's Westland. And uh, that's where the butterfly house is that I built. Um, I gave them that three years ago. And they started buying plants from built from wild type uh, native plant nursery while I still owned it. And um, they've continued buying plants um, there. So yes, they do have native plants there. And um, for anybody else who's looking for native plant cells, I would say there are a number of groups on Facebook, native plant groups and garden groups. And you'll see, I know in our area, there are so many organizations that host these sales. Um, so it's a good uh, place to find other resources for these local sales. 
I, I know that Wiegand uh, has um, a lot of native plants and some of these nurseries are the ones that buy from wild type mm -hmm. um, nursery. Also rochesterpollinators.org. We have a resources tab where, no, sorry, native plant sales tab. We have resources tab as well, but the native, we're collecting uh, one, uh, it, information on the native plant sales and dates and places. Anytime we see it, we add it. Anybody knows the one, email it and we're adding it there. If those are there in Oakland County though, maybe we'll expand. <laughs> and our final question, uh, Margaret Rainwater had one more question, I believe. Yes, thank you. Um, what is the best um, for uh, deer resistance? So how do I get, Avoid the deer and save the butterfly. <laughs> mm, there is a deer. Well, I have a lot of deer in my yard, so it's uh, I could have five or ten deer coming through. So I've tried every single deer resistant plant, and what's resistant in my yard may not be resistant in your yard. But um, the list that I showed today, uh, if you have a chance to look back at it, um, there are a lot of deer resistant species. I've chosen a lot of the liatrices, the deer don't really touch much. The coneflowers, they don't bother with too much. I know I don't use any deer repellent in my yard. So, um, I, you know, I was surprised to see them mow down the Monarda, which should be a little bit deer resistant, but it will come back. So they will mow it down and then I'll just have later blooming. But um, also the butterfly weed and the swamp, milkweed um they won't really touch those either so um and there are, yeah there are a number of others so uh, a lot of times you can just do a little bit of research to see you could look at my list that's probably selected based on what i can grow in my yard too um, but i was you know they stayed away from the i love strawberry wild strawberry as a ground cover and i was surprised they haven't touched the the strawberry flowers so there are onion is another grow. one, but they won't have, they won't touch, they don't like the, the smell of the onion. Oh, yep. oh the onions, yeah, great. Yeah. The onions are a great pollinator plant, yeah. We keep, we're going to compile a list on our resources page as well as we gather deer resistant plants. And I notice, Alita, when they're smaller sometimes, but as they get bigger, uh, they won't. The list that we have in the starter garden that uh, Mary showed. Um, They'll and try anything once. Yeah, yes. well, yeah. <laughs> they'll taste it. Oh, yes, they'll taste it. And, um, but they, yeah, they need food too. <laughs> <laughs> Just not my I don't have that problem. <laughs> I really don't have a lot of deer, so I'm in a city, so I, I, they, they have come every once in a while. Um, okay, uh, I think that was the last of the questions, like we mm -hmm. said. We're gonna close out here. I have a few more slides to go over, um, and please stay if you can. We understand it's gone over, and I'm glad that people are um, patient and as enthusiastic, um, and uh, really appreciate everyone showing up. It made us all feel really good. We put this together. We didn't know who, who was gonna show up to our field of dreams. <laughs> mm -hmm. No pun intended. Um, anyway, uh, collectively, individual actions can make a difference. And it's people like you uh, that are taking a look at their uh, many, many micro piece of a 40 million acre problem of turf um, in, uh, in North America, I mean, in the United States. So we all depend on our natural world around us for survival. And I always say, you know, when I talk to people, you know, we, we can't really take a fish or a salmon uh, to an okra whale or a fish to a polar bear. But what we can do is look in our own backyard and we can do something about it if we if we want to, because it is an ecologically solvable problem. And it's easy, just plant Michigan native plants. And I have a confession to make, I am not a good gardener. And I literally, I accidentally left one on its side last year and it just said, okay, fine. And it just started growing up this way. It didn't care if the roots, if I didn't plant it right. I mean, I'm not that bad all the time, but I'm just saying how easy they are to grow. And I feel so successful. My garden is beautiful. Um, and if you, if, um, if you save the monarch, you can save the rest of the butterflies. Uh, I mean, the pollinators. Um, and you get to meet more people. You make more pollinator friends. They're just really a lot of nice people. I've had a wonderful pollinator uh, conversations. And um, next. 
So there is good news. People like you and others are making a difference. Wild type is selling out. There is a, there is a request at the Oakland County level. We're looking for someone to start a nursery, native, Michigan native nursery in Oakland County. The supply, the demand is, is, uh, 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 is out, um, is the supply is more than a demand, sorry. All right, next. So just a little bit of what we're doing. What are the pollinators doing? June 5th and 12th, we are going to be at the farmer's market and we have our, um, our uh, plants that we're selling on rochesterpollinators.org and you can pre-order uh, and you, we're selling them as kits, but you can also um, come to the market and buy them separately uh, and we can help you um, identify plants that are best for you. Uh, moisture type. And you also get a free milkweed plant, and um, and that's part of what we do, whether you buy anything or not. Uh, Rochester, uh, June 17th, there's a Rochester Garden Walk, and it's a self-guided tour. And the Rochester Pollinators um, dot org on the resource page has that more information there. And the Municipal Park Butterfly Garden uh, is on the tour, and there'll be some Rochester Pollinators um, at the there uh, talking to people with our new garden sign, our new informational three by uh, four foot uh, garden font sign. And so you can get garden plants, native plants, and downloads at rochesterpollinators.org. Just go to the resources tab. Next. And all the resources from this presentation will be on there as well that our presenters shared. Thanks. So here we go, unabashed. This is how we raise funds. Find us on Etsy, Etsy and at Busy Buzz in downtown Rochester. Uh, this was, it was self-funded my, by myself and my company. I was lucky we do marketing and creative work so we could do a lot of the uh, branding and now it's self-funding um, through our swag and through our native plant sales. Next. And it goes, all this goes back into, our proceeds go into the Butterfly Pledge to do things like grow your wings in downtown Rochester. I mean, everybody needs this. And so uh, just come downtown and get your, get, have your picture taken. We have a little, we have an informational signage on the left telling you what to do with it. And, you know, post it on the Facebook page and uh, you'll get um, in, in a drawing um, for uh, $50 uh, gift cards and other wonderful things and a big thank you and a virtual hug from Rochester Pollinators. Next. So one person I'd like to thank too is Doug Tallamy. Um, he's amazing. Anything, anytime I have heard him speak, it has been wonderful. Um, he's an author and an entomologist. He started the In Your Own Backyard movement. He wrote Nature's Best Hope. He founded the Homegrown National Park movement. It's homegrownnationalpark.org. He basically said it's not the national parks that it's going to save. It's, it's, it's everyday people like us. Um, he asked one thing of our gardens that they be pretty now that they have now they have to support life sequester carbon feed pollinators and manage water who thought I thought flowers were just to look at and I know now it's not that at all. So I put his webinar down here probably can't read it but <laughs> we'll have to fix that. I guess we'll put we, we have that in a resource where you can click on it on the resources page next. So for more information, you know, pollinators at trentcreative.com. You can ask us any questions or sign up for our newsletter. You like us, you like us on Facebook and Instagram. We appreciate that. And you can learn uh, more at our website. And then we also are on the city website because we are part of the city as well. And I would like to thank our committee and the butterflies and pollinators. Thank you. But two of our committee members are here, which is Amber Quinsenberry. Um, and uh, Stephanie Smith. And I couldn't do it without my committee and my advisory board, of which Mary um, Davidson is on as well. So uh, thanks so much. And I really am thrilled to have everybody have stayed as long and asked some wonderful questions. So we're here to help you. Just email us. We love talking about pollinator things. And we will send out the recording of this webinar in the next week or so, so keep an eye on that. Yep, anything pollinator. Thank you for your help. Thank you all. Thanks for hosting, Marilyn. Thank and you. Rachel. Very much. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>